Welcome to my Mastering VMware's V6. Here we're dealing with Chapter 5, which is about the virtual networking features of vSphere 6 and vCenter. This chapter is broken up into two specific chapters, and this is actually one of the more lengthier chapters because virtual networking is kind of a big deal. It's how we get our virtual machines to connect. And the sad part is, I don't think any rule book covers virtual networking as in depth as it really should be. Because we talk about a little bit about VLANing, we talk about a little bit of trunking, we talk a little bit about private VLANs and networking. But we don't really discuss that here in VMware. And VMware's uh, vSphere 6 is more than capable of utilizing a lot of those features. So keep that in mind. So we're looking at two different types of switches in vSphere which is a standard switch and a distributed switch. So a standard switch you can call a vSwitch, a VS, or a VSS switch, which is typically just a simple layer two switch. But it's per individual host. You could have a distributed switch, also called the VD switch or VDS. You can share it across hosts, so it's not a single host. You can do one point of management, and it does provide more functionality. In the bottom right hand corner, you're going to see that we have a SAN, we have two physical switches, then we have NICs. So this is a pretty standard layout for deploying a virtual environment. Centralized storage, switches to connect centralized storage, and then our NICs, and then they connect to the virtual NICs inside of ESXi hosts. So we have to talk about a few different types of port groups. Uh, we have what's called a VM kernel port. The VM kernel port is, is allows for management, iSCSI or fiber channel over ethernet storage. It also allows for inter-host traffic. That's gonna be things like our vMotion, our high availability, our fault tolerance, any of the heartbeats, things of that nature. Next, we have what's called a VM port group, and those are going to be our virtual NICs. Keep in mind, we connect our virtual NICs to a virtual switch or a vSwitch, and then we have from our vSwitch connected to physical ports, like we showed in our lab. Our uplinks are going to be those connections between our ESXi host NICs. That's going to be that physical connection. Here's an example. We, we could have a virtual switch. We could have different VLANs on that virtual switch for things like uh, vMotion and iSCSI storage. And then we map them to a physical NIC. Here we're mapping IP storage probably to vNIC 1. And we're mapping vMotion to vNIC 3. Because we can do the mapping again. We showed this in our lab already. So let's look at the difference between vMotion, sorry, not between vMotion, between the VM kernel adapters from 5.5 and 6. You'll notice vMotion is there. You'll notice fault tolerance is there. You'll notice virtual SAN or vSAN traffic is there and management traffic. But you'll notice in 6, we have provisioning traffic, we have replication traffic and replication and FC traffic. So we actually have several new features in six. Uh, with any new version, I mean, again, they're trying to expand out their offerings so that we can do several things. Here's actually where we would be identifying the components of our virtual network. So we're looking at the network settings on our ESXi hosts through vCenter, here it is. So we can actually, I'm gonna get my pencil out. You'll notice these three NICs are attached to this cable. The storage is attached to that virtual NIC, to those PCs, or to those physical NICs. And we have a management network, same thing. But the issue is, all of these five NICs are attached to both of those physical NICs. So if we lost both of those NICs, 
that's it. Also notice they're 10 gig. But that's how some organizations do it. I normally do not use all of this type of traffic to two NICs. I normally try to separate it out so that I have data and management on one NIC. Well, preferably two NICs. That way if we could do failover. But I have all storage on a separate NIC. That arrow is supposed to go to the second NIC. But the big thing here is when we're tying everything to both of those NICs, two different networks, these are going to be trunks. They have to be trunks because, again, they're different networks. Normally, when we do this, we want more than two NICs. We want, depending on our environment, probably two NICs just for storage and two NICs just for our regular data traffic and management. Again, that way we can segment the traffic. So how do we create a virtual switch? As long as we are using ESXi, we already have a single vSwitch 0 installed. We have the default vNetwork port group, again, there by default. We have a management VM kernel there by default. And we have a single uplink, which is our VM NIC 0. That's going to be, again, that default physical adapter. We need to manage any of those components or add more components. We need to either use the desktop client or the web client. We're using vSphere 6, so probably the web client, so that we can manage and add anything. Be careful with the desktop client. Depending on the version that you're using, you may be required to use the web client. Earlier versions, you could use either or VMR 6, sorry, vSphere 6, they're getting more web client dependent. So again, with the virtual switches, we're talking logically, they're just used to communicate internal only traffic. But the second we set up an uplink, we map it to a VNIC or a VMNIC uh, for an uplink, it will actually have outside access. So it's no longer tied just internally. Here we have an example. If we're dealing with two virtual switches on two ESXi hosts, and it's the same ad address scheme, and we're connected to the same network. These are going to be virtual networks down here. You always have to love the diagram from Visio. Then these VMs should be able to talk to these VMs through this switched network. We can do the same thing if we're dealing with a virtual switch and we actually want to separate them. We can still allow for communication this way. We can also allow for redundant NICs to be used. So let's say these are on the same network. Well, they could still communicate with one another. But how do they communicate outside? They'd be able to flow through the switched environment. What happens if this NIC goes down? Well, there's still a path to leave. That's why I'm saying normally you always do two NICs. That way you always have a path to exit. If we're doing data traffic, if we're doing iSCSI traffic, you normally want at least two. Virtual switches, they are managed per host, while a distributed switch functions as a single virtual switch across, this is the important part, across all of the associated ESXi hosts meaning you can set up a distributed switch on one ESXi host and it can distribute it between all of them. This is a data center object and it does give you a lot more functionality, but, but licensing is important here and understanding kind of how they work is also very important here. We have a lab going through a distributed switch. That way we can make sure that you understand it, but you have to be careful here. I normally use distributed switches just because when I'm doing a larger, uh, well, I still do, deal with tiny deployments as VMware's uh, scale goes because a tiny is, I think, up to 400 hosts. 
normally my deployments are still less than 20 hosts. And so trying to manage the switches on all of them gets very cumbersome. So I use a distributed switch that I create through vCenter to apply to all of my SXI hosts just to help save time. Features between a standard switch and a distributed switch, you do want to know. You want to go through this. You want to make sure that you understand them. Things like link aggregation, LLVP, if we're talking about uh, private VLANs or inbound uh, uh, receiving and transmitting traffic. Because you'll notice here, we can actually traffic shape outbound, but can we traffic shape inbound? A distributed switch does inbound. A traffic, uh, outbound traffic is done both through a virtual and a distributed switch. So a virtual standard and a virtual distributed switch. Uh, if we're talking higher gig uh, throughput, we're talking a distributed switch. So again, you want to go through this chart just so that you're aware of the different features. So here we have teaming and we have link aggregation. Teaming and aggregation are not the same thing. So you may want to make sure that you understand both of those. On my exam, I did have a question about teaming and link aggregation. Link aggregation is where we can take multiple links and ag uh, aggregate it to one virtual link. NIC teaming is where we do more of a, like a group of NICs. All right, moving on to the last part. This is about creating and configuring and managing of RV NICs. So the first part is actually looking at NIC teaming. So again, VNICs are the uplinks from the virtual switch to the physical world. We can do multiple uplinks and they can be teamed for failover or link aggregation. Again, link aggregation is for distributed switches, failover works for both. So in this example, we have one ESXi host with four NICs. And you'll notice we actually have two virtual NICs out of each machine. You can do things like load balance between the two. The important part here is we allow two pathways out. So you'll notice if you're uh, looking at it, this guy goes to this switch, this guy goes to this switch. This nick goes to this switch, this guy goes to this switch. That way, if one switch goes out, there's a pathway here. If one nick goes out, there's a still a pathway. So you're starting to start you're starting to see that redundancy built in. You're starting to see when you do our deployments, we're not doing a single point of failure. We're doing multiple pathways. So that gets kind of important when we start talking about how we implement our ESXi hosts into our network environment. So we can create and manage our teamings in different ways. We could do a vSwitch policies or distributed switch policies. So we can do our policies for at least our virtual switches based off load balancing, that's default. We could do it off of source uh, MAC address, off of IP hash, or we could do a explicit failover order. And in our lab, you'll see that we did a primary and we switched a second NIC to unused. But I mean, we can actually set which ones are active, which ones are active, which ones are standby, which ones are active, standby, or unused. This kind of depends, again, on our requirements for our infrastructure. For our virtual distributed switches, load balance teaming and link aggregation, those are, again, two big ones. So moving on, we're talking about creating and managing NIC teamings. The big thing here is we could do ties. We can um, tie a physical adapter to a virtual switch, or we can tie one uplink from a virtual switch to one physical NIC. In our lab, we did that with our storage. We actually tied our internal virtual NIC to a physical NIC. 
just because we wanted to be able to load balance between the two. Again, it goes back to your requirements. So if we're doing it based off the source MAC address, it ties the virtual a network adapter to a physical network adapter based again on its MAC address. IP hash, it's a scalable policy that allows the VMs to use more than one physical network adapter when we're communicating, but this is gonna be based off of IP hash. So I do kind of like this a little bit better because we're doing this off of IP of the virtual machine, not dealing with the physical NICs. So it is a way to be able to load balance between multiple NICs. Now let's talk about our explicit failover option. You can actually override our failover options. So we have an active, standby, and unused. The ones that are listed as active, those will be the active NICs. One that are in standby will just be waiting until a active adapter goes down. So being able to go through all of this, it's important to understand active and standby because if we have standby NICs that are just kind of sitting there idle and we have all traffic going out of one NIC, well, we have one NIC just kind of sitting there not being used. We can create virtual LANs we can separate them through <laughs> through virtual switches, or we can actually do it through a single virtual switch and then VLAN it out appropriately. Uh, I do sometimes create vir several virtual switches to separate types of traffic, but again, it all depends on circumstance. Normally, I do want things like my vMotion and my iSCSI or some type of storage separate from everything else. If I have a highly sensitive type machine, I may throw that on a separate uh, virtual switch as well. It kind of depends. We can do VLANs, just like we would do in a physical network. We can tie a virtual switch to a virtual LAN, and then we can map our trunk ports as they exit. Or we can map one-to-one -one a physical NIC to a VLAN, that way they have their own exit points. We also have things for our private switches, which would be more of our promiscuous mode, which allows a VM to access traffic other than its own. That's more than just a private VLAN. That's more if we're dealing with like port mirroring or IDSs or IPSs. You find that you see a lot of promiscuous mode for private VLANs, but it's not just for private VLANs. It could be if you're dealing with an IDS or IPS. One of the last things we have to look at is the security policies that allows us to start manipulating MAC addresses. That's always where it gets kind of interesting when we're starting to uh, manipulate our virtual MAC addresses. Because if we're dealing with traffic that's being sent and received, we're going to start dealing with integrity issues of both incoming and outgoing traffic. Because you can forge some of these MAC addresses. That's actually it for this chapter. I want to thank you.